welcome to a Q&A from the Witch's Corner. The following questions were received from you to me um, through a variety of means. I have um, email and on some of my blog sites I have um, message contact forms. So even though I'm really bad about responding to these at the time that I get them, I save them and I read them and I find them fascinating. So we're going to choose just a few today. Um, over a course of topics, I get a lot on tarot, of course, tarot, a few on witchcraft, and I get um, a, a few now and then about writing. So we'll try to cover these, and we'll see if there's anything personal in there as well, questions. I can't promise to get to all of them, and I can't even promise to ever answer all of them, but we'll do the best that we can do. Okay, one of, um, one of the questions I get asked a lot, actually, um, you have many clients all over the world and they consult you via Skype or over the phone or through email readings. How are you able to read their energies even when you're thousands of miles apart? That's a very good question, but it's easily, easily done. Sometimes it's actually easier for me to read to someone that I've never met and that I'm not physically with than it is for me to sit down across the table with the person. When you're physically across the table from someone, there's so many little things that can interfere with the psychic thought processes that go with the cards. Um, their orange shirt or or um, their, their fidgety ways or like this stony cold stare or or a, a feeling of desperation or passion for whatever their questions are. Um, when I do readings and I'm totally removed from the physical presence of the person, it's like a veil opens and you get all of this input and all of this um, information and clairvoyant, clairsentient, clairaudient feedback from these cards. So. It's very easily done. How do I do this? I think that it all has to do with energy. I think that when you're reading the tarot or, or any other divination, doing any other divination for someone, it has to do with energy. Energy that's out there in general in the universe, much less than it has to do with the divinatory tool itself or the process itself. It's like loose energy, and you're just kind of grabbing strands of it and drawing it in, and that's kind of how I view it. And um, it's actually amazing what you can connect with. And if anyone has a difficult time kind of understanding, um, this mental, emotional, spiritual, psychic connection. Think of a mother who wakes up abruptly in the middle of the night and she has a child in college 2,000 miles away and they know, they know that something's wrong. This is part of the process of that energy and lassoing it in or having it whip through the universe and and um, connect and light here and there and here and there. And of course, the mother and child have a bond, so that energy is going to zip right back to her. That's kind of how I view um, the way the energy works when you're doing tarot readings long distance for people. And also the same way that the energy works for long distance Reiki healers. So you don't have to be physically present to receive amazing insight or to really be able to use the cards to see inside um, a person's mind and their life circumstances and, and their past and sometimes their future. It's odd how it works. It's amazing how it works. And I'm just, um, I find it a miracle every time I do it. This was a good one from Margie. Um, the question is, what has been your biggest challenge with regards to your abilities and how have you overcome this challenge? This is going to sound very sexist and it's going to sound um, odd to some people. My biggest challenge is reading for men. I sometimes have a really hard time 
connecting to um, males when I'm doing readings. I don't know if that's um, through the years when I was younger, whether it's just an instinctive, instinctive wall that you put up or whether um, it's just naturally because I'm a woman, it's easier for me to connect with another woman on a psychic level. Um, I'm not sure actually really why it is so for me but it's very hard for me to read for men I have overcome this um, and you can overcome this and I have done some uh, amazing readings for men but it is a challenge for me it was more of a challenge when I first started it was um, because I felt it the minute you know if I had a face-to-face -face reading the minute they sit down ahead of me um, the long distance readings, of course, were easier for me, but personal face-to-face -face readings, I could feel like this little wall going up when they sat down across from me. But I have um, had some amazing readings, as I said, and it is something that you can overcome. How have you overcome this challenge? You know, I know that I have gotten much better with it and that I have overcome it. I can't really tell you how. It's... Um, it's a process maybe as we get older and and you don't view individuals as in so many sets and groups. You're not as divisive with them. Humanity kind of splurges together all in one colorful lump. And so the, the dividing lines between male, female, young, old, um, it, it, it diminishes and so it gets much easier with time and it gets much easier the more you practice. Also another challenge is reading for very elderly people. Sometimes there's just you can't make a connection. Sometimes it just feels like there's nothing there. I, I did um, a live reading within the last two months for um, a lady in her 80s and it's like her face is just stone. And her expression is stone and anything I said I could just I could just feel the disconnect I could feel that I, we were not making a tarot connection and um, anything I said it was like a negative it's a no that's not in my life and that's not in my life and that's not in my life and I've often wondered if my inability to read for really really elderly people has to do with my inability to connect with them or the fact that they're coming to the end. They're coming to the end. It's like the final page is turned and there's there's nothing more that's being picked up. That sounds very morbid, but that's the best way that I can explain it. So those were two challenges that I have um, and I am working on um, with the tarot. Interesting. Huh? We do have a very good, a very good question that came up oh no I don't know this person no this is from a stranger but that's okay uh, she said what are common traps for aspiring writers common traps for oh the biggest trap is to hand your manuscript to a close family relative who loves you dearly and they will read it and no matter how god awful it is they will tell you it is the most spectacular wonderful thing that they have ever read because they love you and they might honestly believe this even if it totally sucks so that's one common trap another common trap is um thinking that you're just going to pop this book out and you're going to pop this book to a publisher and it's just going to be picked up like that. Did you know that Dr. Seuss's first manuscript was rejected 80 times before he finally found a publisher? So don't fall into the instantaneous trap that you're, all you have to do is write the book and boop, it's like, it's a sure deal. It's out there and it's set and you're just going to um, ride along on on your author's dream because that is not always the case. Oh, <laughs> one more writing question. We'll take it in twos, I guess. Um, does writing energize or exhaust you? Uh, both. It all depends. It all depends. Um, sometimes, like 
when you when you pressure yourself with a deadline I want to have this book done by this date so I can get it off and and I've worked on all the favorite parts and now the hardest parts are coming up sometimes it's like pulling teeth and sometimes you're totally drained when you were done but then there are other magical times I can explain when almost almost the words are not your own it's like where the hell is this coming from it that I'm not that brilliant to be able to think that up that's coming from somewhere else and you just are screaming along typing away and you read read it and you honestly don't think it came from you and you are just totally energized it's like having 50 cups of coffee and you feel like you're floating um, three feet there are opposite around. extremes so, there are times when it is just so tiring and you are going to try to think of 20 excuses to put it off and not write and do other things and then there are times when you are just gonna fly on some magical writing carpet so that's how that works okay so we've had a couple questions on tarot and a couple questions on um, writing. Let me see if I can find something on the witchcraft. Okay, so I have um, a couple of questions on witchcraft. And the first one is kind of unusual. This is from a gentleman. Who are your favorite witches in history? Actually, I don't have any favorite witches in history. And I'm thinking that my favorite witches in history are the thousands and thousands and thousands of unnamed, solitary, um, hedge witches, kitchen witches, green witches that are steeped in anonymity and lived at the edge of their villages and kept to themselves and um, grew their gardens and dried their herbs and raised their animals and did their magic in total oblivious anonymity. Those are my favorite witches in history. And um, as I describe them, I can almost actually feel them and see them. It's like a collective energy. It's very gentle, very peaceful, very mundane, actually, just living their quiet lives. And those are my favorite witches in history. This is a very common question, actually. And there was something posted to my timeline about a public event involving modern witches that just brought up people by the droves with opinions, both positive and negative. And there was a lot of um, confusion. The question is, are Wicca and witchcraft the same thing? And I can only give you my opinion how I view these two spiritual paths. I would say not necessarily. Wicca, as I understand it, is a neo-pagan religion that got its grounding and rebirth in the early 20th century, most famously um, with a man in Britain named Gerald Gardner, who had um, joined this coven and started writing a journal and keeping track of all the magical practices, and they were setting up rules for membership, and they were deciding on worshiping gods and goddesses and um, developing covens with um, different traditions and um, different levels of initiation and different rules for learning and for joining and for practicing. And that's how I understand Wicca. That's how I understand what it is. And to me, it sounds an awfully lot like leftover garbage from their Christian years where you have to join this church and you have like confirmation and baptism and first communion and you have to you have to do, um, are expected to do certain things or provide certain things for the church in order to be a member so it just bro it just kind of stuck to me like that and I didn't I didn't really it didn't really appeal to me 
Witchcraft, on the other hand, witchcraft for me is almost as broad a term, a term as paganism. Paganism is a much more broader term, an umbrella term that covers lots and lots more things. Witchcraft still is an umbrella term for me and covers maybe a smaller group of practices. It's practicing magic. It's practicing magic and that and, and a path, a spiritual path you create on your own. It's incorporating magic and um, wonderful nuances from a variety of um, traditions. It's experimenting and finding out what works and what doesn't. It's delving into your own concept of morality and deciding what you feel okay practicing and and what and what you don't feel okay practicing what's comfortable for you in this world of witchcraft what's uncomfortable for you what would you rather stay away from and keep out of your circle what kinds of practices do you enjoy what brings you happiness what brings you spiritual clarity and that's my idea of witchcraft. My own spiritual path, which I actually have named my spiritual path, I call it Gray Magirium. It is a combination of green witchcraft because I love me those herbs. There is magic in the green. And it's a combination of Dianic Wicca. Uh, my focus is on the goddess. I, I'm not into patriarchal religion in itself. I have nothing against the God. I view the God as her consort. And his energy is out there too, but his energy is not my focal point in my practice. My practice is focused on the matriarchal divine and her energy. And the other aspect, the third aspect of my spiritual path is hoodoo. It is a hoot. And, um, Yes, there are aspects of it that some people may find shadowy, more in the gray area. I feel um, like voodoo is just too harsh for me, and animal sacrifice harming anything just makes me cringe. And so my hoodoo is probably a very gentle, um, kitchen witchy variation of it. I, any animal parts that I use, bones or feathers or, or parts, um, are found and gifted by nature. Um, uh, I just feel that, that harming an animal for any purpose, and especially just a magical purpose, would bring more negative energy into the working than positive. It's just, and it just goes against my grain. I am a devout animal lover. So my form of hoodoo is probably a very whitewashed concept of what traditional hardcore voodoo practices um, would be. This works for me. And if you want to find out more about my own spiritual path, you will find a page at my website, The Witch's Corner at amethystrain.blogspot.com. And I believe it's like about the witch is what the page is called. So you can find out more there. But that is my view of witchcraft and Wicca.